Um, how's off season going for you right now? Um, off season's pretty chill. I got some interest from both like LEC, OCS, and then some from like Latin America and Brazil. So it's nice to have the i the idea that I'll have options. But um, looks like I'm staying in NA for the nice. most part. I as a fan of NA, I love to hear that. Um, obviously, I want I want to see you play in LCS. I think that's always been kind of where I would most enjoy watching you play because obviously, you know, I worked with you way back in EG um, for a bit, and then uh, I've kind of seen your kind of your career as it's gone. So it'd be really cool to see you come full circle, do the whole like, you know, amateur to NACL two actual LCS would be really nice. Um, yeah, it'd be super sick. Yeah. Uh, so you've been watching Worlds. Keeping up at all, or? Um, I watch today's games of TL vs. Fly, but for sure. the most part, I don't really watch. I'm too busy with school right okay. now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like just today, what... I was studying for eight and a half hours. So. What are you studying? Business econ. Oh, geez. Okay. Well, fall back, you'll just be rich. Um... Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, that's why I'm not rank one right now because I'm too busy like studying. Okay. Okay. Don't time to fly. Yeah, that's tough actually um yeah. yeah people don't often realize either well we'll talk about the solo queue stuff in a little bit but the grind to just maintain where you're at much less get better is brutal with the k games and all that stuff too uh and new new season starting obviously or the new uh new uh split um it makes it really hard like have you felt more burnout or less or has it been about the same for you with the addition of like a third split in the season um, I don't think my burnout's really been affected that much because, like, whether they're three splits or two splits, I'm usually playing non-stop either way. So it's kind of just like the same thing, just like different numbers on the screen. Sure. Okay. So even like I, you know, for me, it's like in, in preseason, I would probably just try things that like, oh, you know, I haven't played this champ. I kind of want to learn it. It shouldn't be that big a deal or whatever. But in your case, it's like, well, it's it's the same matter what because you're playing against the same caliber of player essentially the whole yeah, time. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not much um, changes. The only annoying thing is that early season matchmaking is always like a complete meme. Yeah. <laughs> so. I yes, absolutely. I'm uh so I'm trying to get to diamond this season on one account, on a new account. My old account, my main, is hard suck and silver right now. And I swear the game quality is like about the same. And my other one's like plat to emerald. It, it makes no sense. When but, I play, I personally don't notice a difference between like I and like Grandmaster. It's all the same. <laughs> They just die the same way so <laughs> the same mistakes are being made <laughs> yeah yeah um so what, what were your thoughts on today's series between tl fly um i think i'm like not surprised that FlyQuest won given their current form and like tl's current form yeah uh i thought it would be a 2-0 but ended up being uh two ones was a little closer than i expected it to be but uh yeah i think that FlyQuest are definitely I'd say they're probably better than G2 is at the moment. I think that they're probably the best team in the West I, on the I, good day. That That's a hot take for sure. Um, yeah. I sort I sort of agree with you, obviously. I mean, if we're looking at results, at least, you know, obviously G2 lost as well, but they were playing a significantly harder team, I think. But yep. I think BLG was super beatable, right? Like we saw BLG yep. get taken to sort of a really close state, even against like PSG or uh, yeah, PSG. It was it was actually much closer than it probably should have been. Mm -hmm. um, but BLG yeah. has not been informed. Yeah. And I, I agree. I think Fly just in this event alone has looked way better than TL has overall. Uh, TL had a really, really shaky start. They kind of pulled it together. They obviously have qualified into the today's games, but mm -hmm. it was always a little, little shaky. Um, yep. Even dropping a definitely. game against Gom was like, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was definitely something. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. And then how? Well, I don't know if you saw the draw, but. Uh, FlyQuest is going against Gen G in the next round. <laughs> yeah, I heard about that on Twitter. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky they're screwed. But, I, you know. I think it's the worst possible team we could have pulled. I mean Probably, yeah. I have I have Gen G winning the whole thing overall, so I'm like, eh, really? we'll see. <laughs> I think yeah. that um stylistically it's probably the worst team that Fly could have uh drawn as well because they're very good at that, like very controlled yeah. pace and also I think that um all the Korean mid laners struggle against Chovy because they look after him so much, mm. which isn't good for quad. Yeah, you th you think it's like a mental issue, like a block. Yes. I yeah, see. yeah, I do. That's interesting. It's like actually. NA tops versus impact a lot of the time, where they're like, "Oh, it's impact, it's so hard to win," you know? Yeah. So that was Chovy, where they're like, "Always oh, this perfect player." He's like, "Who I watch wants up to try and improve? How can I beat him?" You know? Yeah. Yeah. What are it's your thoughts? What are your thoughts on impact? <laughs> I think he was the best top in the league. Yep. Ripper was the second best. Um. But I think that 
his form fell off a bit. I scrimmed versus him actually a bunch during the year. Mm -hmm. And mechanically, he wasn't anything impressive. Like, I'd win lane phases versus him or something for Fly or CS. Mm -hmm. The thing that he was really good at is he was always, like, doing something. So if I ever took, like, a moment to just, like, not think, then I'd get punished. And it really was hard. And that's, like, a lot of pressure, even though it's, like, not a mechanical form of uh, pressure inside of the game. Would you say it's a bit different. Like, more of a mental player. Yes. Like he applies pressure just smart. knowing what to do. And, uh, yes, yeah, exactly. That, that's actually really interesting. He just makes the right yeah. decision over and over, and sometimes his hands just, like fail him. Well, I guess we could, at this point, we could maybe say that he is getting a little bit older. Um, <laughs> you can. I don't know how like, real that is in esports, but... um, I don't either, actually. I'm, I'm memeing, really, because I think, you know, we see CSGO players playing at the highest level into their 30s, yep. mid-30s, you know? Exactly, and that's, yeah. like, way more of a mechanical game than League. Sure. Like, let's be real with the aiming and everything. Yeah. Um, who do you think is the hardest top laner you've ever had to lane against, either competitive or solo queue? Keen. Keen, okay, yeah. Keen That's was cool. the hardest that I versed. I versed him in solo queue. He was the the best solo queue player, like the best player I ever versed. Um, when I played this Ben, he was very good mechan. Sorry, not Ben. Isaiah, he was very mm -hmm. good mechanically, but just stupid. And then King and kind of just sucked <laughs> at laning. I think I think a lot of analysts would probably agree with that statement when they watch uh when they watch Zayus lane. It's like, oh, he's he's so yeah. good, but then he sometimes just does things that are like what I are you doing king was better than zeus was okay not mechanically but like in general with the game okay yeah that makes sense um what what i guess are you focusing on right now then besides well you're just trying to think okay well what, what offers am i going to get are you you're not yep. really playing at all right or um, i mean i'm playing a bit i have an account that's about to be 70 percent win rate challenger and then i have another account that's like grandmaster and then Jeez. i have two accounts in like high diamond okay let's but, uh, uh Let's talk a little bit about solo queue then. So obviously you set the LP record of all time in North yes. America, right? What, how did you break the game? Because to me, it felt like, and to a lot of people, it felt like the game has gotten more and more team dependent and you see people coping all the time like, oh, I can't carry anymore. And yet mm -hmm. you're playing in a role that should be a carry role, but is also the most isolated and theoretically the most uh, at the whim of like jungle, all that stuff, right? Like. How did you manage to consistently get to a point where you can carry what's I, I think I forget your win rate was seventy percent or something, right? Like going to that that uh the highest LP you ever hit? Yeah, I think I had a seventy percent win rate at rank one over like five months. It's absolutely insane. Like what so how did you crack solo queue? So there were a few things. Um I will admit that I was kind of lucky at the time because it was um well, I mean I was and I wasn't. So the first time that I broke the LP record. Uh, was when red side was a thing. So I'd get red side, I'd get counter pick as top laner. Mm -hmm. And then the MMR average on red was usually higher, but that part didn't affect me because my MMR like, single-handedly was putting me on red. Right. So like, the rest of my team wasn't necessarily better than the other team. Most of the time they were worse. Like, I'd have four master players versus like, four challengers, mm -hmm. and I'd still be on red side because my MMR was just that high mm -hmm. um, compared to everybody else's. Uh, so the red side thing was definitely definitely nice, but then I think that... like played a big factor i think a big thing was i was extremely consistent i would die very little while like stomping my lane really hard so i'd like be applying a ton of pressure without giving up uh resources to the enemy team there was also like a mental factor it still is on the ladder every single player on the ladder is like they see me on the enemy team or they see me on their team and they either like oh yes he's on my team or oh fuck he's on the enemy team this is so cancel and mm -hmm. then if i make the enemy top go zero ten they just like ff the game i see that makes so that, a lot of sense. That it's, it's that same mental block you're talking about, right? Like yes. you, you load into game and you're like, crap, yes. Surdy's on the other side of this lane. Like I have to play perfect or we're going to lose. That's a lot I of pressure. <laughs> in 90 plus percent of the games, 90% of the games that I've played the split, I've had somebody on my team or the enemy team talk to me in all chat or in my chat. Wow. Just about me being in the game. Wow. It happens basically every single match happens on stream. Jeez. Okay. That makes sense cool. actually. Because then, And then also you, you know that you're going to get attention from both junglers you know you're going to be sort of like a win con right well yeah people will see my nameplate and they're like i'm playing fam yeah <laughs> like they will see me on white space and they'll be like okay i'm pathing to white space and that enables me to carry more as well because now my teammates are playing around me mm -hmm. if i say to do something in game they'll listen because they know who i am like this all matters like i would have lost way more games if for example i was just like i don't know potato chip 37 <laughs> and i say come to that top my jungle is gonna be like no i'm doing gromp yeah but if they see me say it they're like, okay, I'll yeah. go. Yeah, because he there's... comes, he kills enemy top laner, and he takes the enemy enemy's Krogs, resets, takes his Gromp, and he paths down. He still gets his Gromp, and he does a good play. Yeah. Because I'm not going to call my jungler to do something that either one or I think is too high execution for him to do. If I think it's too hard for him to pull off consistently, I'm not going to call it. Because mm -hmm. League is like a consistency game in solo queue. Or 
um, if I feel like there's like not a high chance of it actually working in general, I'm not going to waste my jungler's time. Right. Because like, I understand what he wants to do, and like I get the benefit of like him taking that camp versus the benefit of like him helping me kill my lane or him helping me crash my wave because I play both roles of hit challenger on both. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, I feel like I have a pretty good idea of like what is more worth it to do inside of the game and. I think because of that, my calls align with like what is good for the game. And then the more that happens, the more people believe in my calls and trust me to just do something. And even if they don't understand it, they'll just come. That makes a lot of sense. Do you feel like it's a good idea for people who want to, I guess, climb, improve all that to spend more time playing other roles? Uh, no, not for most players. I feel like unless you're already like a high challenger player in your role, it's kind of pointless because mm -hmm. you have so much to improve on individually inside of your like own role that you're playing that like, why would you play another one? It just Fair. makes yeah. it harder. It's like the argument of should I one trick or should I play like, should I have a champion pool of these five champs? I always say to them, no, like it's not like there's no point just one trick and they're like but then i'll be bad at the game because i can only play one champ and then i tell them you're going to improve a lot faster at the game playing in challenger versus challenger players than you would have if you played all these like other random champions in low elo trying to improve it's way more important to get to high elo one tricking and then branch out because mm. you just save so much time uh as a mostly one trick myself i do definitely feel it though when i let's say let's say swain is banned and i play mm -hmm. any other champion it's like a, a three level drop, right? So if yes. I'm playing in like plat, it's all of a sudden like mm -hmm. I'm I'm silver at best. Yes. It, it's a very noticeable drop off. So do you how do you feel about someone who, let's say hits challenger like one trick and mm -hmm. cane or something, and then they now have to play not on cane and they're playing like a masters player or something. I mean, my advice is just like dodge off your one trick if you can literally only play that champ. Fair. Like you should have your main account where you one trick and then you're like, okay, I'm challenger now. I'm like a challenger level player. And then you have mm -hmm. a second account and you just play everything on it. It makes sense. Yeah. And you, because you're already challenger, there are certain things you will learn from playing in challenger games on your one trick that will be transferable over to other champions. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I don't know what it would be on Swain because he's like a pretty unique character. <laughs> it would probably be like team fighting, spacing, tethering the enemy champs range. Yeah. That you can apply to your low elo games and that's going to make you win more, which is going to inflate your rank. And then you can just climb playing other champions when you have the idea that you don't care about as much. Okay. How long did it take you for you to realize that, hey, I'm really good at League of Legends? Um, well, my first year playing ranked, I ended rank one in Oceania, so I think that told me <laughs> that I was, um, I was pretty good at playing <laughs> League, but I was also like crazy toxic back then. Cool. And Oceania is a special like, region, right? <laughs> I mean, I was even toxic when I came to NA originally. That's what like hurt my rep so much Yeah. for about a year and a half. And it was basically a battle of like, is my League skill enough to get like the balance out? Just like how bad I am at controlling my emotions. Mm -hmm. what so do you that think... was like more of the battle than me actually improving. Yeah, what, what do you think has allowed you to change that? That's something that a lot of players struggle with. I, I always say like mentality is probably the biggest thing holding most people back from actually getting better. I see it in myself. Yeah, I agree. I get tilted. I will play so bad for the next string yeah. of games until I untilt. Um, but how did you fix that in yourself at the highest level already? You know, like basically hitting top 10 and all that. Um, For me, it was like, I realized that the root of why I was getting tilted and frustrated was because I'd feel like I was really out of control. And when I felt like I didn't have control over the outcome of the game or out of my situation, like if I feel like I have to die here, like I'm, I'm killed basically because of the decisions of my teammates or something like that, that would be the thing that like frustrated me the most. Hmm. Like if I didn't have direction forward in the game, I'd get very frustrated at that. So I feel like as I played more and I got better and I started to like understand the game better, I felt like I had more control over my actions and the outcome of the game. And that's what like helped me stop tilting as much. And, and that's that, like, interesting. Aspect of control is really important to me. Well, you, you got to rank one without even realizing that. I think most players yeah. on the ladder, obviously like 99.999% of them are still stuck in that. I don't have control of the game. That's why league is tilting. I say it all the time. Yeah. The reason even league is tilting. Challenger players. Yeah. yeah. The reason league is tilting though is because it feels like your teammates have so much influence over how your game yes. goes versus an FPS game or something where like, Hey, you know what? If you drop 40 kills a game, you're probably just going to win. Yes, but exactly. In, yeah. League, My, so what that. I realized is I can do that in League. It's just <laughs> it won't be 100% win rate. Sure. It will be like 70, 80% instead. Yes. Yeah. And that was good enough for me. In I the mean, sense that if I consistently made the correct decisions, this doesn't mean that the correct decisions for competitive, it's different. Right. The correct decisions for solo key, which is a lot more pressure, a lot more pushing my limits, etc. Um, staying on the map instead of taking 
better tempo recalls so that I can cheese more gold and resources. If I keep making those correct decisions without dying and without like throwing my lead away, then I will win because th the enemies will always make mistakes in solo queue. Sure. So I just get myself as fed as possible and then I capitalize on the mistakes. And a lot of the time when my team is losing, I'll be like two items up on my enemy laner and the game will look like it's in a stalemate and then we'll win one fight, one fight on mid, get Baron, and then the game's over. Yeah. Because they can't deal with me anymore. Right. That makes sense. Because League is inevitably, an, it's a game about efficiency, right? How yes, much, exactly. How efficient is your time being spent? And yes. if you are doing that in solo queue, now that's a, that is really hard to translate into competitive. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different game, right? Because 100%. You can do all that, but you're going to get punished. You're going to get, like, they're going to be able to take advantage of you taking advantage of your time because yeah, tempo exactly, really matters. Because coordination is actually a thing at that point. Yeah. Um, and even though the enemy laner on his own might not be able to punish you when they bring their support into the fray, you're dove. Right. What are some so. of the struggles that you've had, uh, I guess, going from dominating solo queue to now competing and playing in a competitive environment, translating some of those things? Well, I'd say for this, like, last split in, um, in NACL, I spent most of the regular season just like basically testing to see how much I can get away with in competitive versus solo queue. Because mm -hmm. I was trying to squeeze as much as I possibly could. And honestly, I got a lot of really, like, really good information from it in regards to like how much I can do and how much I can get away with. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it's definitely a big, um, trying to apply that same play style from solo queue to competitive. And like I learned by trial by error, like sure. trial and error basically. Yeah. I have to die if I want to learn. It's just the way I am. It's the person that I am. And I mean, it worked out when I was in playoffs. I had like a 20 CSD for playoffs in NACL, which was the highest in the league by like 10 or something. I was smashing every single lane because I went through the trouble of like trying that all, you know? Yeah, makes sense. And so it's like, you, you can't take scrims as a win-loss type thing. It's like, you're trying to learn something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which I think more which teams need to do. admittedly wasn't the best for my teammates at times because like obviously they'd want me to play like as controlled as possible to get immediate results but i'm gonna be honest winning an acl doesn't matter it's meaningless right. i would much rather get like actual tangible information and improvement that will help me going into lcs than focus on winning the nacl split that doesn't mean i don't care about winning nacl like obviously i want to like i cleaned in a lot of the craziness uh so i cleaned up a lot of the craziness and veined it in for playoffs but my time is much better spent learning and improving as a player than it is winning an ACL after I already did it once and it didn't get me a single offer. Yeah, that that's kind of the other thing. Like, what are your thoughts on why you didn't get an offer last year? Oh, uh, I mean, last year I was offered by EG, right? It was a terrible mm -hmm. contract. I was going to be jailed under a contract for bare minimum, like 75, mm -hmm. with probably no housing, like legit nothing, <sighs> but complete bare bones. Wow. Um, I would... I mean, when I lie, I'd probably be living like paycheck to paycheck. I don't even know. Yeah, it would have been horrible. But yeah. um, I was willing to take it because I just wanted to play professionally, right? I'm actually like Loki. I'm happy that that off thing fell through because I think I'm way better poised going into LCS this year now. Yeah, and I have a feeling that if I was playing in LCS last year with like this random team that they would put together of like random players, we would have done very badly, and then my career would have been doomed. Here's I that. I've been saying this for forever. I've seen plenty of players get their one shot and they take whatever yep. offer they can get and it ruins their whole career because you never you never get a chance yes. to actually shine in this game. Exactly. I mean, rookies are best suited to a situation where they're brought up around like three veterans, mm -hmm. basically. Yep. Because then the rookies just have to do what the rookie is good at and the veterans adapt to the rookie and then it's good. Like You hire the rookie for a reason because he's good at what he does, right? Right. If you try and take Sniper and you make him play one in Scion, he's going to look like the worst top laner in the league. Yeah. Instead, hundred thieves lets him play Renekton and Jax because aren't every single game, and he looks pretty damn good. Yeah, yeah. It's the same way uh, when when they have. It depends on where the rookie goes too, right? If you have a rookie jungler and a rookie support playing together, and you have three that veterans, could be an issue, yeah. it, it can be really tough. You're just going to get out. Can, yeah. yeah. <laughs> out I think that veteran jungle on a team is very important when you want a rookie inside of the roster. I think it's the most important, actually. Yeah, I, that's why I've been saying. Uh, inspired is like my go for the year uh just yeah, every roster every every roster he's touched you put rookies with him he's gonna help carry yes. them to like much better heights i subbed in for fly lcs a lot this year mm -hmm. um they're actually gonna if they lost that serious energy i was actually gonna be playing in playoffs mm -hmm. uh inspired is very very op to play with he just tells me where they are and then i'm in scrims and i'm dropping 20 kills yeah because yeah. i know where everyone is 24 7 and my hands were better than every top in LCS. Sure. So as long as I had the information, I just beat them. 
it's like hacking you have a, you have a wall hack yeah he, exactly it's like i had a uav <laughs> yeah so be. yeah yeah inspired by far like one of the most I, I can't even say underrated everyone thinks he's good but like i don't think people realize how good he is and like what he brings they to the team like, so. don't play with them yeah they wouldn't understand yeah. it's too hard to see as a spectator sure yeah what are your thoughts on nacl then as a system i mean obviously you kind of saw some of the changes as they were going through from previous academy and all that into mm-hmm. now the nacl system like what are your thoughts on the changes there um i mean i thought nacl this year was like a complete meme Fair. basically yeah like um only two orgs had academy teams and these academy teams are like very bare bones they're remote they're not even in person mm-hmm. uh the, a lot of the time they only have like one staff member so like the head coach so like a lot of the improvement is left up to like the players individually and then i don't think that winning it actually matters to going pro um i mean i think that it can get you in the conversation get you looked at but at the end of the day whether you are promoted into a team or not will be because the gm mentions hey what do you think of 30 and then the players on the team are like oh yeah it's good i wouldn't mind playing with him and you don't get yeah. the always oh, good i wouldn't mind playing with him by winning an acl the lcs players don't care about that that's that's actually the biggest problem is like the path to pro right like the fact that it's a personal relationship type thing is i think severely detrimental to the entire player base trying to come up because it doesn't I mean, matter if you win everything you have to know without a promotion like system there are so many players that are never going to get into lcs not because they haven't like earned their right to earn into lcs or because like their top tier academy team couldn't beat like the bottom tier lcs team it's because they have no way to prove that like they are LCS caliber even if they win an ACL because they're completely separated. Sure. Yeah. Hey, thank you it for the rage. Just doesn't matter. Appreciate it. Um, what are your thoughts on improving that system then? What would be like? Would you want to see like a combine? Like, how would scouting be better done in North America? So EU teams, something that they do is they put they put a lot of emphasis on try both tryouts. Mm-hmm. And they also uh, look at the VODs of players. In NA, that's not really done. I think it's only done by like C9, for example. Mm-hmm. But, but in EU, they'll like look at the players' personal VODs, look at how they play the game, look at the decisions, actually watch their POVs. And they won't just watch one game, they'll watch like five or 10 of these players that they're looking at. And then they can get like actual discernible info. The I, coaching staff yeah. can. I, I think C9 only does that too because they have an EU coach, right? Like they have Probably. Big RV2 is like the one who's like scouting yeah. all these solo QERL players. Mm-hmm. Um, and he plays against them and he's like, Hey, I think these three are really good. And they like, take a look at them. <laughs> yeah. But like yeah. in NA, that doesn't happen. Nobody right. is looking at the people below because unless the org is trying to go budget or something, well, like they're not going to go out and look, the players have to be, like, I, have to like that, be that's, brought to them. Yeah. I think that's the frustrating thing though. Cause like, if you're trying to go budget, it's better if you can find someone who's out there who isn't like, you know, Jojo Poon, for example, yeah, where like he's going to get a max off. Yeah. You, you can find someone out there who's basically, like you said, probably willing to take a minimum contract mm-hmm. and develop and just wants to get better and learn and get a shot. And you can bring them in for much cheaper than like the cost of scouting, the cost of the coaching staff, all of that together and bringing two or three of these players in is probably less than one of these superstar players. Yeah, it's probably less, but then you also have the, um, like, there's a bit of a, a problem now where there's only six slots in NA. Right. It's so hard to justify promoting a rookie over a veteran when there are only six spots. Yeah. Because where are the yeah. spots for the rookies when there were 10 teams? Well, you had plenty. My, my eight, opinion was that they eight, should... you don't have many. With six, you won't have any. They, yeah, they, they should drop some of the funding. So that's basically, mm-hmm. I think LCS needs a, a salary cap meaning that there's a ceiling that's more reasonable and then mm-hmm. every LCS team should be forced to have an academy team again. Like then you inc- Oh, I see what you mean. You you, I think that you level it. it's communism. Like... You level it out and you and you share some of that money, right? But it allows for you mm-hmm. to then have developmental systems and teams underneath mm-hmm. to encourage new players to come in and get a better look at them. Cuz I yeah. I agree with you. It's it's a huge investment to sign a player and have them not pan out when you could just sign a free agent who's been in LCS for like four or five years. Yes. It's um actually I kind of like that idea in the sense that I think that if there aren't academy teams in NA, the region's dead and there's no future. I agree. Yeah. It doesn't matter how good the production is getting and how well LCS teams are starting to do. Like they are getting better and people are actually getting invested and excited about LCS again. Viewership mm-hmm. is going up. Mm-hmm. Everybody's like, oh, NA actually has a chance at Worlds this year, you know? Mm-hmm. Like that kind of thing. We like we've people have been like 
oh, I can't wait to see NA at Worlds, but they haven't been like actually excited about them going or doing anything for a while now. Yeah. And I've talked to fans because I speak to my fans a lot, mm -hmm. and I like having um having dialogue and conversation with the people who actually like watch the game, getting their opinions on me, their opinions on LCS and stuff. I have tons of LCS fans who come into my stream and watch me because they're like, oh, this guy's probably going to promote. Like, and then and I talk to them about um about things, and I've only really ha heard positive things about League over the past like year. Yeah, I agree. They've like, done yeah, a great job of branding yeah. it better. Um, but that's but, not going to matter if yeah. all the talent tries up. Exactly. That's that's the problem. And I've been I've been struggling with the idea that like all these decisions seem to be based on viewership when viewership is not going to be relevant. Exactly. If there's no actual pros coming up, uh, viewership yeah. took a huge hit when a bunch of the old pros that everyone was a fan of retired. Yes. So you have to replace that. Um, and I, I definitely think that the fan opinions on this stuff is much more directed now towards, we would like to see North American players get a shot. We'd rather see that than us actually trying to say, we're trying to win worlds every year. I think the vast majority of NA fans now would be like, Hey, who cares if we're like making it the semis at worlds? What we care about is our NA teams doing well. Like, are we, are we promoting players up? Does it look like we actually have an ecosystem? Are there players that I'm a fan of personally? And then we get to go watch them play at Worlds. I think we 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 got to yeah. we have to stop coping that we're gonna win Worlds in the next five years. Like it just doesn't it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> hey, give me a chance. Give me a chance. <laughs> well, okay, okay. We'll give you two years at least. <laughs> okay. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's the idea that you're trying to catch up to systems that are so much deeper, right? You look at LPL, LCK, the way that they recruit and promote and develop talent. Mm -hmm. It's unreal. Like, I mean, that also stems from a player base issue, though, within North America. Correct, yeah. Uh, culturally, Americans are way less inclined to play league. Yeah. People want to play games that are quicker for the most part. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, the learning curve is ridiculous now. Yeah, um, the learning curve is crazy, too. Yeah. I, Even, like, China's uh, developmental system is getting, like, slashed because of the government right now. Really? Because of the, um, the things that they put in where they're like, oh, if you are under this age, you cannot play games more than like this many hours a day. I, I did hear that. And you can't it's really It's destroying the yeah. LPL ecosystem, completely destroying yeah. it. You can't learn league playing one or two hours a day. Like yeah, exactly. you just can't do it. Um yeah, that's that's really tough. Uh for their ecosystem. I mean I understand why they're doing it because I think China had a significant problem with like over gaming. Like they were Yeah, they did. Yeah, these kids are like literally dying in PC cafes because they're gaming for like four days straight. Like <laughs> It's Sounds pretty like bad. Me. <laughs> yeah, but you survived, and that's why you rank one now. So, yeah. Uh, so I'm the one white dude with the work ethic of the Asians, apparently. <laughs> yeah, you should. I mean, actually, you know what it reminds me is like I did an interview with APA a while back, and he said the same thing. He's like, I fit in with TL because I have that Korean work ethic. He's like, I like to grind 14 hours of solo queue. He's yeah, like, same. it just, it just makes I mean, it makes sense to me, you know. <laughs> the only thing about that TL roster, Yon and APA were both my old solo queue duos. Yeah, there you go, right? You guys, because you guys can sit there and probably play the game with a, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't know, like less emotional approach to it, and you're just focusing on, I just want to play and get better and, and win, or is it, or did you guys have like those rage nights of we can't end on a loss and you lose like nine in a row? We definitely have those sometimes, <laughs> but for the most part, um, we just played with each other because we thought that we were good. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Like we were. They, I mean, yeah. apparently, everyone's everyone so far has made it except you, but you were hopefully going to be there soon. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, I would yes. love love to see that, uh, especially you know some of the teammates you used to have, right, and collegiate and all that. Some of them maybe competing against people you used to play with and with against. That'd be awesome. Yeah, um, be so cool. hopefully, you know, uh, if you can talk about it, you know, what are what are some offers that you're super interested in going to? I guess what would be your top three? So um, about I mentioned earlier, Jackies and Giants X in Europe. Mm -hmm. I was actually reached out to them as well. I think that the um whatever metric they use, they found Jackie's through some like I uh, think that they use which analyzes solo queue and finds the best solo queue players. Itero probably the uh, AI. Surge, yeah. Um, Surge also has a system that does it. For me, um, like the big management agency, Surge. Um, mm. they actually like showed me that two of my accounts were two of the top. They were the two best solo queue accounts in North America. Yeah. I I held rank one and two in like the top three. Jeez. for that um because of like that whatever metrics they use yeah which is kind of crazy to me because on my second account i really don't try i just like i just mess around but but even then it's like you're doing certain things habitually at this yeah, point I guess that so. you probably are like so um yeah. giants reached out to me about the possibility i'm pretty sure they're going with somebody else um i was i spoke a little bit to sk in europe okay uh, as well and then um inside of na 
I don't want to talk too much about who I'm talking to in sure. America because there's still like actual opportunities and I don't want to give anything away. When I do say something, the first people who, who will hear about it will be like the people on my stream. Yeah. I'll tell them sure. before I tell anybody else, even my friends. That's great. Yeah. Maybe I mean, my girlfriend will know before them. <laughs> Hopefully but, um, three of the top three orgs. I mean, <laughs> I mean, four of the orgs are locked top is already there are two that are left. Okay. So viewers okay. can like infer from that which two might be interested in me in one way shape or form one of them is that wells so. okay all right well we'd love to see it um i guess what are your thoughts on collegiate so you played in both nacl and collegiate and one of the things that i was always kind of uh, proposing was that collegiate in north america needs to start becoming the next actual path to throw in tier two because like you said right now in tier two in, in nacl you have two orgs actual orgs mm -hmm. and everyone else is sort of like group of friends like, th like they're think put together trying to compete it's going to be really hard for the collegiate to ever become okay so that the two things two things one thing is i think that for sustainability if money keeps being put into it by these schools yes it is great for aspiring pro players and stuff mm -hmm. the issue is you can't go to a good school and also try and go pro at the same time you have to choose sure i'm at uci right now and my workload is way too high yeah if i i was at st louis before um the workload there was fine at UCI, you need to make a choice. You need to go to UCI, you need to go pro. You can't do both. Yeah, I think that's why a lot of players there do it the other way. They went pro, and then when they retire, yes. then they go play at UCI yes. or whatever. Yeah. But, um, so I mean, they could like go to some trash school in the middle of nowhere if they want to. Mm -hmm. You're not going to want a degree from there. Like, you're not going to want to graduate from there inside right. of the US because uh, much better options. But if you do it under the guise of, oh, I'm going to go here for two years and then transfer into a good school because I keep my grade average relatively high mm -hmm. um, and I get to play collegiate, then yes, it could be a good environment for improving. But I can't see it ever. I can't see something completely independent of Riot ever being a viable path to pro in North America. That makes sense. Uh, it, it's sort of, I mean, I guess the comp comparison is always like traditional sports, right? D1 athletes can do both. But yes. I, I think the time requirement is actually very different. It is very different. I mean, for a D1 athlete, of course, the training is very heavy. And like there's a big um, physical toll, like 100%. But you have training for like, what, an hour or two a day, maybe? You need to play more than an hour or two of like a day if you want to go pro. Right. A yeah. lot more. <laughs> yeah. So do you, do you have any... Uh... Oh, Risen and Eastwards. Thank you for the, the, the braid as well. Uh, do you have any, I guess specific theory or specific training practices that you've adopted over the years that are going well for you or you've adapted in order to be able to climb more efficiently um the most helpful one for me for my individual improvement um stemmed from like spreadsheeting my games i have like a little um a google sheet stock uh, where i can like input what champion i played what my objectives are for the game and then like whether I completed them and I will briefly like look over my deaths in queue sometimes and be like, was this death because of me or not? And I try and look at it from like a very unbiased lens and take as much accountability as I can because placing that accountability onto myself and changing what I do in the future gives me like control over the outcome of the game, you know? Yeah. Whereas if I just look at it and I'm like, oh, I died, sucks to suck, my jungle wasn't top. It's like, okay, I mean, great, I'm, I learned nothing. <laughs> That, that you're, yes, okay. you're, you're like yourself. you're like the 99 percent of players who are coin flipping every game because yeah exactly you either win or you lose you i don't do that anymore yeah. because um i can do it like consciously in my mind while it was happening now hmm. but for a while in order to begin to like distance myself emotionally from what was happening in the game and like look at things through a more logical lens it really helped yeah that's actually really good i'm trying to make a climb this season to diamond and it's like trying to actually do it right you know do the vod reviews yeah. like focus on what i actually control not the fact that my support is inting me um i mean loki you play swain right yeah if you're playing swain and you're trying to climb to diamond get as much cs as you can yeah and just like rock up to fights and kill everyone that's like, you're gonna climb i'm playing swain bot lane too so it's uh it's rather broken uh, yeah that's sure yeah so that's nice actually that's use. mainly when i bought so i'm doing with a friend of mine who's a jungler who's also emerald and peak and he's never hit diamond either but whenever we've odd read, that's the number one thing that comes up is like, why did you die here? And it's like, oh, well, I followed my support. And you're like, okay, you can't control the support, yep. but you don't have to die here, right? Just yeah. play your game. Sit, you're right. Sit there and farm and don't die and you, you're going to win 80% more games. Like, yeah. So. Yeah. And solo key for sure because everybody else is just going to end randomly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then eventually when you've done that to that extreme of, oh, I've sat here and just farmed, you'll begin to recognize situations where it's actually okay for you to leave. Mm-hmm. 
by doing one extreme and saying, no, I'm not moving to this no matter what, you begin to like see patterns and situations and realize what is actually okay and what isn't. That's really good advice, actually. I'm going to I'm gonna have to use that this week. No. Um, cool. And then what about, so you, you mentioned you don't think people should diversify their champ pool. You think they should no. just sort of one trick or two trick? If you're not a challenger, one trick. If yeah. you are a challenger, probably one trick. Unless you're trying to go pro, then stop. Okay. So if you're trying to go top lane uh, to challenger, what would be the chunk of one trick? Gwen? Oh, yeah. God, right hate... now? Right now, Gwen. I hate seeing Gwen. It's so broken. It's so, it's so <laughs> disgustingly broken. I, I see Gwen. Who, like, she can she can completely grief her lane as long as she's farming the 0-6 and, and still, at the end of the game, just be like 1v9. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely broken. Um, cool. The champions that I like the most for solo queue, um, and which I used to my climb, uh, on my white space climb when I was 92% win rate, 1KLP, I was playing Camille, Twisted Fate, Gwen, Yon, Jax, Jace. I was playing these champions who scale insanely well with gold and have agency in their early lane phase. Hmm. And I was just winning my early lane and then eating every single resource on the map. Okay. Okay. As long as I don't lose lane, that. I can always carry on those champs because yeah. they scale harder than most of the other champs in the game. Yeah. Uh, the NA Jace. But no, I think Jace... scaling's too OP in solo queue. <laughs> yeah. Jace is, I've seen Jace just completely take over games. It's actually really, really broken. He's more team reliant than the other options. I'd mm -hmm. only pick him on like R5 into comps, which were low range where I had frontline. Mm hmm. Because then it's like it's too hard for my teammates to mess it up. And yeah. as long as I do well individually, we just win. Yeah, yeah. But Gwen is a great pick. We can sideline. Yes, Gwen is amazing can, right now. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then any advice for aspiring pros? In NA or other well, well like otherwise. I guess specifically NA. Oh God, what can I even say? Um, <laughs> how do I? How do I? even give them advice it's so hard to go pro right now and i'm not gonna lie like there's a chance that i didn't promote right which is like i mean i haven't like promoted yet there's still a chance i don't promote and if i don't promote i mean honestly just like everybody quit the game it's just impossible if i can't um literally yeah i mean you've done everything you need to do like anything on yes. paper that a gm would say oh if you do all these things mm -hmm. you know you have an active stream mm -hmm. you hit every possible award uh played collegiate played competitive you played academy like yeah i don't know what else you would need to have on a resume the best advice i can give is be very high rank in solo queue get on good terms with like the lcs players like play if you see an lcs player in your game on your team or on the enemy team try hard no matter what yeah make yourself look good because you looking good in those games to him will be like okay this guy isn't just some random solo queue until it will like put that seed in his head. Honestly, and the more you do it, the better he'll think you are. Like I had Umpty yeah. add me out of solo queue and be like, "You are the best native top." I had Thanatos add me out of solo queue, and before his LCS games, he was like, "Please one v one me. Yeah. You're the best top." And I was like, "Yes, I will." And That's then awesome. I one v one him before his LCS games, because I always play well in their games. Like if, if you consistently play well in these guys' challenger games, they will begin to respect you. Yeah, and I, like, I mean, I've literally sat there and heard pro players discussing potentially picking people up. Like yes. the next season, and, the, and they're it, really harsh. They think you're bad in solo queue. If you end them in solo yeah. queue, they will be like, "This guy's completely boosted." Yeah, I'm yeah, not, yeah. I refuse to play with them. Yep, that, I've, I've heard GMs and coaches talking, and they're like, "No, I can't play with that guy." Like, yes, exactly. He, he's into me. He's actually into like me. one of the biggest barriers yeah. to like a player like Zamudo getting promoted, for example, is the fact that there are a lot of people, like a lot of LCS pros, who think that he's like super troll because of his shampoo and stuff. Mm -hmm. Where like he plays like work, he plays like. Are uh, these weird champs and like some games who are just completely sprinted in solo queue and that legitimately puts a bad taste in a lot of LCS players' mouths. Yeah. Not because he's a bad player, it's just like this like preconceived notion of him is now in their heads. Like back when I was toxic, the same thing for me. Yeah. No, and I think that's real because it's like a human reaction, right? Everyone has had yes. that game where you're like, dude, this guy's completely running it. He's griefing yes. me. And if you look at their match history and all that, it was the one bad game they had. Yes. But it sticks in your head because it affected you. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, league players, they like build good opinions of players very slowly. Mm -hmm. Very, very slowly. It's like a point system where like, okay, you did something good, you get one point. You do something bad, you lose 10. Yeah. Like you need to consistently do good things over a very long period of time while minimizing the bad things you do to get people to actually have a good opinion of you. That's why for me, if I randomly just peaked rank one, or like if I randomly did that, 92% win rate, uh, win rate times a 1k LP and then I just dropped off the face of the earth everybody, everybody would be like it was a fluke oh yeah whatever he's like yeah. he's fine but playing, he's like not anything special boosted champions, like. yes and then I I held the spot of the highest ranked top laner on the server for like 6 months straight and I was 1v9 every game that I was in and then everybody was like okay you know what it's it's no longer just a fluke this guy's actually good yeah, yeah. and 
that creates that positive opinion. The big reason why if I play LCS next split, I'm going to play LCS is because the LC people who are in LCS had a good opinion on me. Sure. Do you think that uh, some of that, I guess, inability to develop good feelings or thoughts about your teammates, all that's or your you know your solo queue teammates, is due to lack of communication though? Like, how do you think voice chat would potentially affect some of this stuff? Cause... It would just piss them off even more, honestly. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I, I think it would just make them more frustrated. I would love voice chat personally because. Yeah. I think it would cause people in solo queue to improve at a much faster rate. I agree. I think yeah. we wouldn't have as much of an issue with the gap of players in competitive and solo queue being so big if they played in voice together. Mm -hmm. Because then you would have like Zven in this solo queue game saying to his support, do this. So like Zven to his um It's like coaching an example because he's like yeah. yeah, it's like coaching inside yeah. of the game by mm -hmm. telling them to do these things. Mm -hmm. When I tell my jungler, I'm like, hey, on this time I come and dive, or I say in a minute and a half dive top. Like mm -hmm. I'll legit type that in chat when my slow push is starting and they come. It teaches them to like look for that and do that. Yeah. If I don't say that, they'll never do it once because they don't play top lane. They don't know what to look for. They don't know how to help me. Yeah. They only know how to help themselves. And I'm... that the difference between a solo queue player and a comp player is comp players know how to help each other and they can then make the conclusion of is me helping this guy worth what I'm giving up? Yes, no. Yeah. I, I've just noticed in like Valorant, right, which has voice chat, a lot of times yeah. I've learned something from my teammates where they're like, hey, I'm going to flash here. You're going to look mm -hmm. this way. You're going to do yep. this. And I'm like, yes. oh, that's a really smart play. And yes, I would they, never know that if they just ping something and then throw a flash, you know, like, yeah, yeah. they're I, going I, to be bad experiences in voice chat in any sure. game or any competitive environment, no matter what. But I think that in any competitive game, especially because of the issues that NA is having with developing talent, it's creating way too big of a barrier between the ranked ladder and competitive play, um, relationship wise, and also gameplay was and that's a really big issue towards the development of a region yeah i i totally agree i've always had good experiences when people link a random discord and you like go in there and there's like three or four people in there and they're all talking it's a better experience in the game even win or lose like i've had so many incidents where i'm like if we weren't in voice chat right now i know that my support fail flashing this wall and dying everyone would be spam pinging and everyone would lose their minds and we tilt and we lose the game but because it was in voice chat like someone did that like oh shoot my bad i fat fingered that and immediately yep. it's all forgiven. Like, oh, we've all done that, you know? Like, okay, cool. But I, I just feel like League not having any sort of interpersonal relationship and, and, and in fact is trying to mitigate it even more. Now you have people telling other players like, you should full mute at start of game. I'm like, the most frustrating thing in the world for me was spam pinging my support because I see the jungler coming or something and he just doesn't back off. And then at the end of the game, in yeah. lobby's like, oh, I'm full muted. I'm like, dude, how am I supposed to play with yes, you? Yes, like, I've experienced that. <laughs> that was so but I also can't even limit them for full muting. A lot of the time, the information that we give in game is useless. It's just things. Yeah. And like, if the negative effect on the on the gameplay, if somebody spam pings them, is it like outweighs the useless information they're gonna get from their random solo queue teammates? Sure. But it's the uh, furthering of limit limiting the communication over and over. Like now there's like almost no way to communicate. Yeah, there have been a bunch of times in Challenger where like one of my teammates is full muted. I've hard carried them. And then after the game, I legit say to them in post game chat, do not deafen in my game again. Yeah. Like I just say it verbatim like that. Because like, okay, deafening like your random solo queue teammates games. If you have me on your team, don't deafen. I'm not going to grief you. Like right. mute everybody else. I don't care. Don't mute me. Right, right. That's like, a... I get that point across to them and... Yeah. yeah, it works. I mean, that's it's a it's a challenge for sure. But I I totally understand it too to preserve mental. I definitely think most anyone below yeah. challengers probably does not play the chat. Period. There's just yes. there's no information in there ever. Yeah, <laughs> I'd agree. It's just completely useless. Yeah, like they're they're telling you stuff that's legitimately wrong. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, at least if there's voice chat in the game, you can all do the wrong thing together. Right, right. That's actually something I noticed playing in Korea is uh you know when I was playing Korea in, in low elo obviously, but like when they fight, they just all fight. They, you'll yes. you'll see three TPs come in like level three like they don't care. Oh yeah, they commit. They will full commit and hey, because you they know send what? It with the boys. Yeah, if you win it, now you're way ahead and like yes, yeah. Uh, I, that was actually something I really enjoyed uh, about the playing there. It's like it's so it feels chaotic, but at the same time, it's like oh, this makes sense because what they're trying to do is they're trying to win this game as soon as possible. Like, There's also the thing of everybody in Korea is paying for PC uh, PC bongs. Oh yeah. So your time is charged by the hour. True. That's why FF is so common. Yeah. If they fall behind, they're like, just FF. I don't want to waste my money. Yeah. That makes sense. Now they're oh, wasting man. money as That's well as time. It makes a lot more That's sense. That's also why yeah. the games are so fastly paced over there. It's like, fight. If we are better, we will win. Let's waste as little time as we can in the game so we can get into a new one and can play more. It makes a lot of sense. And that's yeah. also with the ping. 
plus that plus like the uh yep. just the mentality of that i mean coverage like spam fight too because yeah. like such low ping is like oh god i have confidence in my hands they're not you're playing on na and you're on 42 ping and you're like oh i can't flash this despite the fact that i'm pressing my button before it hits me i mean i was seeing silver players pulling mechanical like callista plays off that were like th this should be yeah. like gm level that's in legit. NA. it's crazy that's legit because of the ping by the way yeah yeah it's like actually because of the ping i mean i don't think the ping is like as big of an issue for climbing solo queue just because the level of the players is so low mm -hmm. like I hit 22, 27 on nine ping in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And then I went down to 2050 and then I climbed back up to 2207 on 42 ping in, NA, uh, in LA. Yeah. yeah. So I climbed back up to my peak on that higher ping. Yeah, so it's like yeah. not that big of a deal. No, I, 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 mean, it's a yeah, deal, I don't want to say ping is the issue. Yeah. Win. In NA for sure. Like if you're comparing ping and NA, it's it, like the player base is the player base. But yes. yeah, in Korea, I noticed like a lot of players in low elo or still low elo, they make horrible decisions. And they don't know what they're doing in terms of like builds all that. But at the same time, their mechanics are insane. Like, yeah, I mean, that will, that will happen for me just playing the game. Yeah. Um, well, I uh, wanted to ask a couple of questions here. Uh, actually, this is a really good one from chat. Like someone asked, how do you think doing all this has changed you as a person? Um, I think that I've learned a lot of very good life lessons from League in the sense that I was forced to become somebody who is easy to be around and easy to um easy to work with mm. because if i didn't i was screwed um it's definitely made me mature a lot as a person but it's also jaded me a lot in life i have a very different view from a lot of the people around me because i've been like i've been screwed over in esports before not once not twice or like three times when i was first on eg tsm reached out to me about going lcs mm. EG put like a half a million dollar buyout on my head and said, we're not letting him go. And then they told me they were keeping me and then kicked me the next off season Jeez. just to rehire me again on a contract, which was like probably illegal at the time Yeah, because I wasn't even on the GCD yet playing Academy. This mm -hmm. is when the Academy system was back in the thing. And then they like told me that I was going to be LCS all off season. And then that vanished as well. I realized that you just can't trust anything that anybody says ever until it's in writing in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. That's which that's a... it's good but it's also bad because i've lost that like that starry-eyed view in the world of like oh people don't want to actively harm the people around them they want to like yeah everybody is like obviously they have to look out for themselves but they're also trying to be good to the people around them that's what i always thought i thought that people wouldn't like be actively malicious in a way to the people around them but i've realized that that is 100 percent wrong yeah unfortunately i think that's true of most industries not just esports i remember in my first off season after my first year of academy i could have gone for my friend's spot on his team but i actively didn't because he was my friend mm -hmm. and i was like i'm gonna gonna have a spot anyways there's no reason for me to screw this guy over and then my other friend at the time uh his name was soul he ended up taking my spot on eg like he reached out to eg even though i was on the org and i was guaranteed a spot with them even though he was guaranteed a spot on tl uh, tsm just because he wanted like a little more money and then i found out that he took my spot by him bragging about it to my ex in call in front of like some of our other friends and then i was like well you cannot trust anybody in esports wow. these guys are just massive assholes that's crazy actually i know soul yeah um yeah works with them at eg a bit that's that's really he really stole a pc on his way out of eg yeah. funny story he brought it across the border so they couldn't do anything. Wow. That's crazy. Well, I mean, esports is definitely an industry where you see a lot more of that, even though people think of it as like, oh, there's pros, there's so much money in it now. It, it's still kind of the wild west. It's very, very new. Yeah, I mean, it's completely full of snakes. If the orcs yeah. can get anything over you, they will do it. Yeah. Uh, you need to be really careful if you are an aspiring player. You need an agent. Yeah. No matter what, get an agent. And and this is a, something I've told I've told every pro too. Please get someone qualified to actually read your paperwork yes. before yes. you sign it. You need a lawyer you will, to read your stuff. They'll act like they're your friend and they'll put you in a predatory contract and lock you down. Yeah. I mean, people don't realize even like, oh, they, they just like, oh, the salary's there and what they require is there. You, you don't read the fine print and like, it's so bad. Yes. It's so bad. Uh, like they would... Orgs, if you don't do something, will like they'll sign you as a rookie and they'll be like, okay, your base is going to be like 100, 100,000 a year. And we're going to sign you on a three-year contract. And you'll be like, oh my God, that's so cool. And then you perform really well in your first year. And at this point, your player is already established in LCS. Your salary should be more like 200, 250. It's not going to change. You're still locked into that 100. Yeah. And then during your prime years of play, you're getting paid way under your gameplay yeah. level. 
So like, it's really important to have clauses like after my first year of play, let us renegotiate depending on my performance. It should be. Yeah. But so you wouldn't know to add that clause. Unless you have exactly. Player, if like, you don't go through yes, that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then there's been a lot of, a lot of issues too, with people like not getting any sort of guaranteed money. Right. So you get sign a contract like that and the org the next year decides, Hey, we're folding. Now you're just cut. You have nothing. You don't have a job. Yes. You don't have a house that happened to some of the golden guardians players. Like they, yep. their apartments are not like putting in proper severance, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Completely like when shocking. I signed on EG and I, I signed, so they kicked me from EG and then I took my spot back the next split, mm -hmm. weirdly enough. And they put me on a contract where I had zero severance whatsoever. They, so my contract got ended early. And the only reason I even got two weeks of severance pay was because the head coach and like the coach of the org legit went to management, and like threw a fit. They were like, you cannot just release this player after he carries your team from like last place in the academy to finals on zero severance randomly before his contract was meant to end. Like that's so, so messed up. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Um, it's, it definitely requires a lot more professionalism and a lot more organization. I think, you yes. know, I've, I've always pushed for, there should be a players association, right? There should actually be a union. Yeah, I mean, there should be a union, but none of the players are going to unionize because the unionization won't help them in the short term. Exactly. And the yeah. players are all very short term focused. It, it, it's it's, it's going to cost players now, but it's going to benefit players forever in the future. And that's what they just don't want. Yeah. They don't want to sacrifice the now. It's like, exactly. you know, your esports career might be two years. Why would you give up $50,000 or whatever in order to benefit everyone after you? Yes, ex yeah. 100%. Yeah. It's really bad. And I mean, low key, that's valid. Like the longevity just isn't there. And it's a performance based industry. You could be cut whenever. Yeah. I mean, I've unless you have like double lift and Bjergsen spearheading it, people aren't going to do it, and unfortunately, they're not in the league anymore. So, who are we going to rally behind? You know, yeah, nobody. Yeah, I mean, realistically, former pros should be the ones to spearhead some of this stuff. But it would be nice if they could. <laughs> yeah, predatory management. I mean, the orgs are definitely. Uh, now, I've had my fair share of run-ins with orgs where I'm like, man, I can't believe you guys operate like this. Like, there is no, yep. there is no loyalty. That's the other thing. It doesn't matter how much you think you love who you work with or work for, mm -hmm. like the org that you're with. They don't owe you anything. They're not going to give you anything. They will never, ever bend over. Or... The worst thing you can ever do as a rookie is be like, I want to play for this team forever. Yeah. That is, oh, like, I love this team. I was brought up in this team. I'm going to play for them. Unless you are their franchise player and they need you because you are the future of their brand, you just take whatever the most money is. Okay. <laughs> Whoever your highest chance of winning is, just screw it. Yeah, I agree. You got you to gotta look at yourself. Like they they didn't one. bring you up because it benefited them. They brought you up because they thought it benefited. Uh, sorry, they didn't bring you up because they thought it benefited you. They did it because they thought it benefited them. Yep. They're always working for themselves. Yep. Um, so you need to do the same and protect yourself. <laughs> Rosman wanted to know, uh, why is matcha better than coffee? So Rosman is actually my positional coach on EG in 2022 mm -hmm. in my first year of academy. And I had like really bad anxiety issues back then. I don't anymore. But like caffeine, like everybody else in the office would drink coffee and I wanted to drink coffee because I was like, I mean, they must be doing something right, right? Mm -hmm. If everybody's doing it. But the instant release of the coffee, the caffeine would like make my anxiety spike. And yeah. matcha was slow, slow release over a longer period of time. And so it wouldn't cause me to, um, wouldn't cause me to go as like, hmm crazy anxiety wise i don't know if it's placebo or if that's actually a real thing but for some reason it helped i mean i definitely think uh the amount of caffeine is less because you know my girlfriend has anxiety too and then whenever she drinks she can't even drink real like full coffee she drinks decaf or half calf i drink four shots of espresso in the morning when i wake up no, on no food no what? that that might be no. excessive uh as so a healthcare one. professional i think that's probably an excessive amount of caffeine but <laughs> i gotta um, do what i gotta do bro like <laughs> I, I'm I'm, a, I'm at least a one one cup in the morning, but um yeah that's I actually only had one cup this morning. Okay, okay, yeah I had a little bit of I had an espresso too. Uh, do you have any other like random things that you do health wise like that you're like oh this is something that worked well for me like how how often do you like take um, care of your physical health? I mean I've started going to the gym again. I like cooking for myself is like therapy to me. It's really nice. That's um, great. I really really enjoy it because there's just something about it that just calms me down. And it's also, if I get really tilted in solo queue, and then I cook, I'm always untilted by the time I finish eating and cooking everything. So that's nice. Um, I make simple things like uh, stir fries with like onion and bell peppers and rice and chicken and stuff. Okay. I like to eat relatively and I love protein. I'm celiac, so I have an autoimmune disorder and mm -hmm. I can't have wheat, which means that um, 
I stay away from carbs most of the time just because a lot of uh, gluten-free carbs are like either very calorie dense or very very heavy um and it like gives me brain fog so i try to eat just like protein most of the time okay which obviously is like relatively healthy but, yeah, you know. yeah you're almost uh inadvertently doing like a like a keto, keto. diet yeah yeah i am yeah. basically i'm not like opposed to carbs but it just kind of happens sure well, i mean if you have a health issue with it then it makes sense it's actually yeah. kind of kind of good um actually i have an idea a theory that like Joe Dupin is something similar, not necessarily mm -hmm. celiac disease, but yeah, I have a feeling that he does, and that's what's causing him to be late. Because from my understanding on EG, he was late a lot because he was having a lot of issues in the bathroom that's, after he'd eat. That's kind of the rumor. Uh, I don't remember exactly the issues with EG in terms of him being late. I know he was oftentimes, yeah, he would go to the bathroom. A it, lot. it was a toilet. It was a toilet issue. Yeah, that's why he was yeah. late. Yeah, so, I'm pretty sure that he has something wrong with his stomach. He just doesn't know what it is hopefully that gets resolved because yeah that's something that as a health issue you know it, it goes beyond just like oh his uh i'm gonna his it goes beyond him being late that, too because yeah. it makes him so much worse of a player at the same time right yeah i mean it's i mean the i can only imagine associated yeah and it's imagine horrible. like you're, you're trying to play and then your stomach is hurting yeah. like oh it'd be horrible <laughs> i mean um, it's just like too hard to play at the highest level if you have like outside factors affecting you sure yeah um all right well yeah we're about an hour so i want to thank you so much again for taking time um anyone else in chat if you guys have any specific questions that are within the realm of reason uh feel free to ask while i have jet here um again i really really hope to see you in lcs soon uh this next season i think you're going to be one one of the more dominant top laners which i think is something that we've been lacking a lot in lcs um it's been I don't know. Hopefully the meta shifts in a way that too also makes like top more interesting than just tanks. Cause... That would be nice. <laughs> I, I would like that. Yeah. I think that regardless of what I do, I've learned like I know what my strengths are as a player. Yeah. And I think that the best players in the world are not jacks of all trade. They have the thing that they're really, really good at. Like Viper and his um traditional AD carries. Mm -hmm. Like Chovy and these scaling picks that he farms up on. Like um Bin and his jacks. And I think I'm starting to understand my identity as a player. And I think that I'm going to just keep trying to play towards that because I think that's really important. So yeah, a question I asked all the pros is, you know, game game five of Worlds and they give you very last pick. Who are you going to pick? Like, who's the champ that you want to win this game on? <laughs> I mean, it depends on the comp. I know for a fact that there's a time and a place to be a good teammate. And in game five of my NACL lower bracket series, I should have said, screw you, pick me Rumble no matter what, I will carry we had yeah. never lost a rumble game. Thirty games in scrims on stage, never lost a single one. Yeah. And I didn't. I didn't say that because I was trying to be a good teammate and I was trying to let my teammates get the things that they wanted. I should have taken it into my own hands, and I'm going to do it next time. Yeah. Okay. Leave nothing on the field. Well, if meta, because every pro says that. Oh, it depends on the meta and depends on the comp. But comp aside, if they, if you need to pick, who, what, what champ would you want to win on and get your world skin on? If I had to choose a champ to get a world skin on, I'd say pick me Camille. Camille. Oh, okay. If it's I love a good it. game for Camille. Pick me Camille. I'll carry that game no matter what. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I've always, uh, I think, was it, was it, uh, plans? One of the plans they just been, uh, been played Camille and it was insane. Like, it was, uh, it was versus SKT. Okay. Yeah. He, yeah he was playing... just flying around, just nuking people, yep. like one shotting He's them. One of the best Camille players in the world. His old name was Love Camille in Korean solo queue when he was top 10 on ladder. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Oh, one, one yeah, other question. Have you caught up on Blue Lock Manga? <laughs> I haven't completely caught up yet, no. Okay. I'm at, um, I think I'm at the Ubers match. Nice. I don't read Manga. I've watched the show for a little bit, but... Season two's out now. Nice. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Surdy. Yeah, of course. Uh, best of luck in the rest of off-season. Hope mm -hmm. to see you on stage soon. Sweet. Thank you for having me. Appreciate right. it. Take care. Bye.